There are today. So this is Justin Trudeau just talking about the indigenous on community. reserve in Canada who cannot safely drink, bathe in, or even play in the water that comes out of their taps. There are indigenous parents in Canada who say goodnight to their children and have to cross their fingers in the hopes that their kids won't run away or take their own lives in the night. Young indigenous people in Canada struggle to get a good education and though residential schools are thankfully a thing of the past, too many Indigenous youth are still sent far away, far from their families, just to get the basic education most Canadians take for granted. Good, so I want to start it off with that, just a little excerpt with Justin Trudeau talking at the UN, addressing the UN, and one of the biggest things that he discussed about was Indigenous issues, which a lot of people don't know about. And this is something that we're really honored uh, to have uh, someone on the ground floor um, uh, working with the current issues uh, right now in an area that is, it's all too prevalent. I had the opportunity to be in Kenora this uh, summer and got to see it firsthand, a reality in which, you know, being from Toronto, we just don't see. Mm-hmm. It's so out of sight, out of mind. So uh, I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Carla. Carla is here to study and train with us. Um, Carla is a superstar in so many ways, <laughs> which we're going to discuss as to what that's all about and what that means. Uh, but I think at the, you know, the first part is just like, welcome and welcome Hi, to Toronto, welcome to our world. And <laughs> we're stoked to have you here. And this is just a real uh, informal conversation around the issues that a lot of people just don't see. There's a sort of dark underbelly to Canada, Canada's past, especially with residential schools, which I learned when I was in in Kenora and uh, some of the you know startling statistics of like 50% of children under the age of 16 are committing suicide mm-hmm. so I'm thinking well then that means you have 50% of the kids taking their own lives then you have 50% of the other set of kids that aren't taking their own lives living with that trauma mm-hmm. and I just you know I don't see um, I don't see how it's actually working on the ground level because we're all the way out here, although it's been a major issue for us uh, with the Persistence Karma Projects, working with uh, trauma, working with youth who've experienced sexual trauma, uh, physical trauma, and neglect. Um, The orphanages in Peru, um, you know, having the aspiration to do something here has always been on the forefront of our uh, sort of um, mandate or consciousness. And so it's really an honor to have you here to sort of like, you know, spearhead this sort of next adventure for us as we take it sort of together like a bundle of arrows, you know, stronger (laughs) together because I'm sure it's very daunting, the reality. So if you want to just talk and have a have a conversation. Um, Yeah, the these issues are just so pressing to me in my life in particular, and I see them every day and uh, and I'm just learning every day. There's so much that I don't know about the actual history of what happened and, and what's going on and I'm and I'm learning all the time. And I think the biggest thing that kind of came to my attention is that the the vast majority of people have no idea not only the conditions that First Nations people are living in, but what was done to them in the past and what is being done to them currently. Um, I recently did a really informative um, talk uh, with a gentleman that came into town and it was uh, an Anishinaabe engagement training and he talked about spirituality and, and language and really interesting things like that but he talked a lot about the treaties and it was really eye-opening there's just so many things that I didn't know um, the original treaties when they were created were really amicable on both sides both parties um, wanted peace and this this co-relationship um, reserve land was set aside um, as special to First Nations people that they could use for hunting or for ceremonies and then the rest of the land was actually meant to be shared and that was what was agreed upon by both parties and it was years later that that got twisted and manipulated and things bit by bit were taking, taken away from people. Uh, there's a misunderstanding that Uh, a lot of things are being given to reserves and given to First Nations communities and that's really not the truth. Um, The 
those treaties have set up a system where almost no one even has status and you only only people that have status are able to get these benefits mm -hmm. um, that was something that I didn't really know and the conditions for status are so erroneous like two First Nations people like they they laugh at the term status because it doesn't mean anything to them like if you marry out of your particular reserve into another one like your status is taken away and that might have recently changed but there's so many random rules to say who is a have and have not in those mm -hmm. communities but um, just so much suffering and I had recently put up an article on my Facebook feed that was one man's story and it was called I am a second generation survivor of residential schools and he just talked about how both his parents were in residential schools they suffered greatly they both became alcoholics and his entire childhood was spent taking after um, his parents so at six years old cleaning up after the house and making breakfast and getting drunk people out of his house and he was treated really poorly and he was abused and eventually he became an alcoholic and it wasn't until he went to prison himself that he became sober and started seeking out um, a more spiritual life, tying into his traditions and his culture and seeking out other sober spiritual people. Like he was just a really strong character to be able to not only get out of that cycle, but then to find the small select group of people that are doing amazing things. I put that article up just saying, we all just need a little more understanding and compassion. Mm -hmm. And the backlash of negativity that came mm -hmm. from that article, I, I was so shocked. I had no idea that there's still, like, who's fighting love and compassion? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, like, well, my parents were survivors of World War II, and they overcame all these atrocities. Mm -hmm. My grandparents too. My grandma's actually in the museum right now for a lot of the things that she um, had, or the what the Mennonite people had had to go through. But it's 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 so different on so many levels. We're talking about generations of people, like the, just the fact of like taking someone's children away, mm -hmm. that just destroys communities. Mm -hmm. And having how, how do you bounce back from that? Like you hear a lot of people like get over it how do you get over that right this family's ripped apart right so you were talking to me about the racism uh the rampant racism that exists up there and also too how this sort of top-down effect occurs when you know the adults are suffering the children really suffer and this is what this story sort of alludes to it starts when they're young and then it sort of becomes a dis-ease as they continue mm -hmm. to grow up and I don't want to say that it's it's necessarily racism, but lack of understanding, mm -hmm. for sure. There's just little to no understanding. Um, I mean, we're, we're taught things in school still that are incorrect, like about the treaties. So if, if we're teaching our kids misinformation, how it, sometimes it's not people's fault, but mm -hmm. it's, it's still something that needs to change. Do you find that because it's not in our... Um in our vicinity because they're they're living in a separate area that's why it's so like disconnected like we don't we don't even i don't even think i've ever seen a real mm -hmm. uh, first nations person outside of like ottawa okay you know? is, is, do you think it's like the distance oh for sure out, out of sight out of mind yeah yeah i mean there are many really beautiful reserve communities surrounding kenora and mm -hmm. i think a lot of the people um often that are in town are are homeless or people that have been kicked out of the reserve for their mm -hmm. behavior so that's a lot of the stuff that people see they don't see people in their normal lives with their families at home mm -hmm. like they don't they don't know the deal and and every community is so different some have more than others um some have better practices um in place to support the community like they're all very very different and how do you support the uh, community what's your interaction with them on like a, you know um, I offer youth programs. I work in our local high schools. We have a lot of Anishinaabe kids in our local high schools. Um, our youth programs are for everyone. Um, but uh, I have a couple of really amazing friends that are doing, that are Anishinaabe themselves and are doing really amazing things in the community that um, revolve around tradition. Just people that are really proud of where they came from. Um, and they help individuals who are suffering by pulling them back into tradition, mm -hmm. into ceremony, into um, 
ways of living, like hunting and harvesting and language. Language is so important to Anishinaabe. Um, these are all really, really great tools. And, and just coming back to that sense of, of pride, it's, just, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy issue, but it's like how do you teach someone self-love? That's, that's, right. that's a loaded question. How did, you, how did you get started in this whole thing, this charity? Um, I, I, I didn't know that I was going to end up in Kenora. I was living out west for a really long time, and when I got transplanted there for the long haul, I was kind of looking at what, um, I don't even know if I was looking for it, but it, it, it found me, this opportunity found me, and um, I've just been saying yes to different doors that have been opening. There's just been lots of really amazing people that really want to help and that already work with kids and they've just been lining up and falling into my life and I've just been working along with them. Mm -hmm. Can you you talk about your first start when you were saying there that um, like you weren't even looking for it so like what was it that drew you to this in the first place? Um, I was really I was having a hard time in life I think and um, prior to that I was having I had a really good life. I was just kind of partying and having fun and skiing and doing like really fun things for me, but I wasn't really doing anything good for anyone else. And I think it was when I started going through a difficult time myself, it made me start looking outwardly into things that were maybe a little less shallow and looking outside of myself. And, you know, I guess it was almost selfish, like making myself feel better by helping other people, but that's kind of what pulled me out of the hole was um, just starting to be of service to other people. I was like, if I can't get my act together, maybe I can help people that are having a harder time <clears throat> than I am. And this, of course, is being on top of a mom of two, mm-hmm. <laughs> a wife, a studio owner. Mm-hmm. So it's like you have, you know, this great calling to do like this work that, you know, surrounds you. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, when I met you, it was sort of like it was the suffering that sort of took you in. You know, there was this like um, eye to eye direct experience with something that, Mm -hmm. you know, you could easily add to. Life was so good, there was abundance for you. And, Mm -hmm. you know, to share that with such deficiency, it's almost like a natural union with younger girls. You know, I remember that when we first Mm -hmm. met, you were telling me you were Mm -hmm. working with the, you know, the youth and just like the positivity of like strong female role models. And you were telling me that beautiful story about that, what was her name? The one, the woman who is the boss. Um, like my teacher? No, there was one, the medicine woman, who was the one who was doing the walk. Oh, Jasmine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah. strong female, you know, leadership yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and I think the, the direction towards kids came from, like, my own uh, teenage. I, I was bullied really relentlessly in junior high for two years. Like, this group of kids made sure I didn't have a friend in the world, and I went home in tears every day. And and going through that led to a lot of problems for a really long time. I got into addictions and just like really, really self-injuring activities for a while. Mm-hmm. And had I had the skills and the knowledge that I know now at 33 with yoga meditation and mindfulness, if I had had those gifts or someone that was a teacher of that sort back when I was 14, I would have just done so much better. Um, and then I met a, a lady named Ali Maz, and she works with girls already, and she has a similar story. And we just really connected, and I saw what she was doing for youth out west, and I was like, I, I need that. I can do that here. My community needs that, and we need a place for that to happen, and that's when I opened up the studio. Studio ownership wasn't really a calling of mine, or I was happy just teaching yoga. I didn't want my own building. Um, and it was when I, I did this youth training, and I was like, you know what, they, they need a, a place. They need a really good place to go that's not just in a church basement, or they need a cool place that they can call home, because for some of them, home's not safe. So, You alluded to the yoga meditation um, helping you now, and if you knew it back then. Mm-hmm. Well, what is it about the yoga meditation that like, would help you back then? Like, what do you drive from it, derive from it? Mm-hmm peace, connection, um, love, like 
being bullied for so long led me to have eating disorders for a really long time. And when you have an eating disorder, you have such a disconnect from your body. You don't pay attention to what's going on in your body. And yoga is very much about awareness. You feel everything. You start to feel everything. Um, and for a lot of these kids that are suffering too, the only way that they've been able to survive, often as long as they have been, is by not dealing with it, is by not feeling. So we get them in there on such a base level, like we don't need to talk about what's going on, let's just get you in your body, let's just start moving, let's just start breathing. We can talk later when you're ready for it, but there's a lot of healing just in the flow and movement and the practice and art of yoga. Um, the conversations can come later. Yes. Would you, yeah, just the role models, you know, like just like you being a female role model to these girls. Mm-hmm. Like, is it, is it sad for you to see the lack of, you know, role modelship amongst the parents? Is it sad? Like, what, do, what energy do you get working with these kids? It depends on the kids. Like, kids that are young are so resilient. Like, God has less children with that by making them in some ways immune and strong because they're very much just children and they bounce back even well I don't want to say they bounce back but they um everything's new like a really poor child doesn't necessarily know that or compare that they are just they're just a kid they're just playing you know what I mean like they're not uh they don't compare like adults do and it's only it's usually when they're older that they kind of realize how messed up things were Mm -hmm. um there are some older girls that i work with and it's 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 sad to see what they're going through and they don't have a way to process it and i don't i don't have the answers for them like some of them have really terrible stories um my job is just to provide a safe space for them and they can start working on that stuff but yeah i don't i don't assume to know any of the answers and i don't preach anything at them i'm just creating a safe space what kind of feedback do you get from the teaching with the girls Mm -hmm. like do you see it's positive or like Mm -hmm. it takes a long time though it takes a long time to build relationships with kids Um, we took a little break over the summer and some of those girls I've been working with for months and they when they came back this year it was like night and day difference like they just ran in that door like wow. this is my home I'm comfortable with you I know like what we're gonna do here um, some of them like I went into a school once and I think I worked with them for six weeks and I didn't get a word out of any of those girls yeah. and they just sat there and they stared at me and then after a while then they start being comfortable and then they I I think it's important too that I keep showing up especially the ones that are going through some tough stuff you don't give up you just keep on showing up and you show up and no matter whether they're like behaving or like out of control like you just keep coming and eventually they they realize that you're sticking around because maybe other people in their lives haven't been Mm -hmm. for sure do you want to mention a little bit about the not-for-profit? Just exactly like what it is you hope to achieve and what it is you dream for it. Um, I'm starting a non-profit that will uh, provide free teacher training programs for First Nations men and women that are willing to work with kids. So they'll be trained as yoga teachers and youth leaders. And I have a partner, Dan Yerksa, that will be coming in and, and either refreshing their knowledge on or in some cases it'll be brand new, uh, just teaching them about language, culture, traditions, history, all things that they can then turn around and give back to their kids and their communities. Because I think at the end of the day, for all these different northern communities, it, whatever help they need, it needs to be self-sustaining. It needs to be coming from people within their own communities, people, like people that already know the kids and, and want to work with them. What do you find is the biggest problem um, prevalent in that area right now, especially with it, Kenora is such a beautiful area and there's so many amazing things to do that and people don't take advantage of them like I'm a really active person and I love sports and hiking and climbing and skiing and all these things and uh, definitely some people take advantage of these things but not everyone um, so in schools for example like they have hockey and soccer and that's awesome but if if you're not like a team sport person like what do you do and I just really strongly believe that 
activity keeps kids out of trouble. They have lots of energy. They need to burn it. So I started a wellness academy at one of the high schools. We do a combination of yoga, mindfulness, uh, exercise, outdoor activities in Ontario. We're just getting them exposed to all these different things that they can do that they might not have been aware of or may not have wanted to try. So maybe they sign up to do the academy because they're only interested in martial arts. That's cool. But you're going to get introduced to all these other things too. Um, I think that's our biggest problem. It's like there's so much that you guys can do uh, that won't get you into trouble. Mm-hmm. Is there a reason why? Is it funding? Like, Because I know like hockey, you have to buy the equipment and all that. Well, Kenora, Kenora started out as, um, it's a blue-collar town. It didn't start out as a tourist town. It was mm-hmm. a, a mill community. Um, I don't know. There's people from all walks of life there. Like, I, when I lived in Whistler, everyone was, like, the same demographic. Everyone mm-hmm. was, like, within the same age group. Mm-hmm. Everyone already liked all these sports, whereas this is just a regular town. This is a real town with people of all walks of life. and. Mm-hmm. For some people, it might be income. For some people, it might be that they live rurally. Um, there's lots of people that live externally to Kenora. Um, so there's lots of different factors. And these First Nations people all live within Kenora? Uh, there, are, there are people that live in Kenora. There are people that live in, in different reserves around Kenora as and well. Your studio works with bringing these people in? Like, how, how does the... Right now, our, right now, our studio works with whoever comes to us. So I work in local high schools in Kenora, mm-hmm. and then we advertise our youth classes. That's open to anyone that wants to come. That's awesome. um, the nonprofit will look at bringing people from northern communities to town so I can train them. Oh, I see. And then once they're trained as yoga teachers, then they can go back to whatever communities they're at and, and share that with the kids. Oh, so it's like a hub. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. But you deal directly with Native uh, First Nations people uh, currently? Yes, like uh, all kinds of people, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's a lot like the Carmen thing. When I first met her, I was telling her, like, I was working with Carmen that teach to fish, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, you eat for a lifetime, and we were discussing it. And she's like, that's exactly, you know, what's in my head, you know, in this vision and this idea of, you know, you know giving that knowledge uh, to someone who wants it and then, you know, offering it to them because they themselves are inclined to it rather than trying to force it into the community or get people, mm-hmm. you know, to do it because they must or it's part of something rather, you know, when it's yeah. by, you know, consent and volunteerism and, you know, choice yeah. and you give that to totally. people choice. And there is a little bit of yoga um, in some communities too, but what's really cool about that mixing of tradition and yoga is that there's so much crossover in between exactly. First Nation spirituality and yogic spirituality. Uh, one of their words for hello and then means the light in me sees and recognizes oh, nice. the light in you. Namaste. Yeah. Um, and just uh, the way, a way of seeing that I'm not different than you, I'm not different than this tree, we all come from the same mother, we all come from the creator, is very much a yogic sense, so I'm not even really, like, teaching anything new, which is what's really great, it's like, here's what you already know, um, this is already a part of, of your tradition, so yeah. that's a really cool mixing. Yeah, that's uh, something like in Peru, it was almost like it was the same thing with the yoga, it was, it was an easy transplant, because the shamanism was so prevalent there as well and the breathing and the working with the plant-based medicines and the sort of conscious exploration of the mind and then you put the yoga in there and you have the posture and then you have the posture being linked to the breath and the posture being linked to the breath that brings about like the yeah. consciousness and the shift and the change and that's why it was great it's great for adults but then when you're working with kids it's like you know they're really they got a lot of wibbly jibblies especially if they're mm. you know in one of the more you know um I'd say like more uh, uh, prison-like orphanages, you know, where they're, you know, at-risk girls or, you know, if they've been rescuing them from the street or, you know, they have a pending court trial, so they're not really allowed out uh, mm-hmm. as some of the other ones, uh, like uh, the first one, the Casa, uh, one that you guys went to, but we didn't go to the other one mm-hmm. with the older girls because they have... Um, you know, they're not allowed to venture out of the orphanage. It's just not safe for them. Okay. So, you know, being confined, you know, yoga brings a lot of freedom. Mm-hmm. And we found that in order to get to that state where they sort of understood it, it was all about like, 
channeling more like the yoga warrior, like this martial arts energy, because there've been like traumatized, there's been, you know, victimization, there's a lot of silencing around a lot of these issues. So it's like, ah, you know, getting them to express yeah. themselves and yell, scream, hit, you know, challenge, you know, the very get notions, it out, get it out. Say, yeah, and that that's interesting that you said that because my original youth training, like we use yoga meditation, but it was very much about like conversations. Mm -hmm. And then, but then when I started actually working with these girls, like they did not want to talk. Exactly. And, and when you kind of find out like their story, it's like, well, no wonder you don't like, how do you, we can't, how do you make that right in your head? Exactly. So yeah, using the actual, just like practice of yoga, like healing through movement, through sweating, through breathing, um, same like from like with tradition going to a sweat lodge and it feels better to sweat out your problem you can pray silently you don't have to tell people what's going on um, smudging it away like there's so much healing in the ceremony of letting go I think talking is a really important piece but sometimes people just aren't quite ready for that Absolutely. and there's all these really supporting practices that can help people feel better in the meantime and what often happens is like uh, well I, I find that if you if you talk about it, it's like reliving it, but it's just another way to get out of your own head. If you mm. find a way to channel the energy out, yeah, because you know, it must be difficult to like, like an inspirational and, form. Yeah, and then you like yeah. you have to be told like so like what's your problem, and then you're like okay, what is my problem? And then they think about how bad it is, and they can't like communicate yeah. to you. you know? Well, that article that I was telling you that I posted, what I found really interesting that he said is that you know when he's drinking, he was numbing mm -hmm. his story and that he was never able to heal until he became sober and allowed himself to That's feel right. that pain That's right. and that takes so much courage to mm -hmm. be able to face that head on um, so you know at some point that that has to happen you have to face your problems head on but once you do that then we can move past that mm -hmm. you ever hear of um, this thing called perennial wisdom it's um, it's this underlying uh, theme within all like religious or like uh, yogi or spiritual practices, which is like who is underneath all of this having this experience, and it's like every because you were saying that uh, First Nations and yoga it's like similar, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like all we're really doing is trying to figure out how to navigate best throughout this life and deal with the obstacles or problems that mm -hmm. that we encounter, you know. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like that's what you're trying to do as well, you know, like give them a solution. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've, I've pulled in a partner that, that is First Nations, because I don't want it to be like, here I am with a solution for for you guys, and, and I don't I don't fully understand where you came. Like, I'm so green, I'm just learning. Mm -hmm. it, having someone else come in and refresh people on on things that they already know that it already is very much a part of them or their traditions or their family's histories that is the most important piece so I, I can teach you yoga and I can teach you the things that I know but I think at the end of the day the most amount of healing that's ever come in those communities has come from that integration with community and tradition yeah, which I can't provide so that's why for sure <laughs> There's yeah. that fear of like cultural identity being lost, you know, because like mm -hmm. yoga is a very like Indian tradition, and then you have uh, martial arts, which is a very like Oriental tradition, and then mm -hmm. you got the First Nation, so it's like which am I gravitating mm -hmm. towards, you know? And it's like they're all right. Yeah, they're for all sure. Right, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. What is it about the martial arts that's like drawing you to like what do you like about like why? Are Ooh, you? well, I like that um, some of the girls that I work with ha are are actually in danger. Um, they actually could use the self-defense piece. Um, but it's just another form of movement that they might also just think is interesting. So some girls are like fully on board for doing yoga and then there's some girls like, I don't want to do yoga. So like, well, great, maybe you're interested in like being a ninja. Yeah. And we can mix the other two together. Yeah. So it's just another piece that I can offer them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's where I found like, um, well, two things. One thing is like having someone like Dan, you know, you know, being your 
advocate mm -hmm. because he's in like that's what it sounds like he understands the yoga as mm -hmm. a first nations person mm -hmm. himself as an indigenous uh, person yeah, and like, mentor to the he's, community his grandma like taught him how to meditate when he was just a little boy and so he's he's down with like the mindfulness awesome. and he had a, he had a really great family by the sounds of it yeah and it's funny how that seed you know gets watered uh, from one generation to the next yeah. and now here we are like you know proliferating it from others and you know working with youth and I think what's the next interesting thing is is like the ability to give people variety within their consent you know like you said mm -hmm. it's like oh we got this yoga thing oh not into yoga okay do you want to be a ninja mm -hmm. and I think that's really interesting for kids just knowing that they can play many roles that they can yeah. you know be a kid and be inspired and have fun with this kind of stuff and, that's and you guys know with was, yoga too there's so many kinds of yoga and so many different teachers that like you know sometimes I see yoga and I'm like I don't want that because mm. it's about finding the right teacher and totally. the right kind so there's there's a kind of yoga for everyone but some mm. might not be as appealing as others yeah. so what kind of yoga do you practice um, I love like a really hard sweaty vinyasa practice <laughs> yeah I'm just started well, I've been teaching for eight years now and I'm just starting to enjoy like yin and restorative just starting to appreciate oh, it oh tells me it's your worst class it's your least favorite class i'm actually starting i struggle in yin like you're supposed to not fidget oh i want to i want to move so bad um it, it wasn't until stress had caused a physical illness in my own body that i started recognizing my need to chill and i hear it all the time and i used to be one of those people too that were who were like you know, when I flow, that's my meditation, or when I run, that's my meditation. That's really good for you, but it's not the same. Exactly. One, one gets you. you revved up, and the exactly. other settles you down. And it was very hard for me to learn how to meditate. It took a few times of just hating every second mm -hmm. of it, and now I love it. I could sit there for like hours. It feels mm -hmm. like it feels blissful, and no one tells you that about meditation. Like when you actually get into it, like it feels amazing, and there is no like time or space. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard. We're used to being distracted. We watch Netflix, and we have our phone, and we're conversating and doing something else all at the same time. To just do one thing is really hard for people, and I get that. And it takes practice. It's a practice. So what, what was the what was the hardest part about the Yin class? You're saying like saying still, did you find your mind racing or so much the mind racing being present in discomfort. So my buddy Karen made me do a 15 minute pigeon once, yeah. and I was very angry yeah. the whole time. And I know it was it's good, good for challenge. me. It's a good challenge. It's a good challenge. Oh man. To move, yeah. I like to move. I'm just starting to now, like when I teach, I mix up long holds mm -hmm. with flowing. I like yeah. I like the both, but there's um a, a teacher of mine, Ryan Lear. I just did a class of his, and sometimes you go to yoga, and the teacher either like says something really heart wrenching, or maybe it's a song that like drums up stuff into you, and and it can get kind of emotional. This class that I did with him. There were about 80 people in the room, and I was right at the front, and he didn't say anything that I can think of that kind of got to my heart or my head. Mm -hmm. We were holding things for a really long time. We started off with a three-minute headstand, and then we did some really deep back bends, and the whole class, the theme was, like, if, you know, if it's painful, obviously get out, but can you be in a deeply uncomfortable position mm -hmm and stay and be present and then eventually transcend. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing these big back bends and I come out and all of a sudden tears just started pouring out of my face. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I was sad or reflecting on anything. It was like the science of what he was doing. And I thought I was the only one in that room that was crying. I was like embarrassed, I was like hiding it. And I turn around at the end of the class and I look behind me. There's 80 people with the exact same mm. reaction, just like tears everywhere. And I was just like, wow. And he's walking around with just this like very knowing look on his face. Yeah. Just like, I know what I just did. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't explain exactly what that was, but there's, it's it's an art and a science. Mm -hmm. There's there's an energy, we're release, we're creating space for energy to move freely. Mm -hmm. um. I find that with the the faster paced classes, it's like it's like task based, like what we're all used to, right? Mm -hmm. That's like just get it done. So like move through the the flow. Mm -hmm. But with a yin posture, it's like 
it's almost like somebody's screaming at you in your face and you have to be able to like uh, disassociate from it which is a lot like life you know when you get cut off you know there's no way you're gonna like move through it you just have to absorb the tension you know yeah and that's what yen yeah, teaches well that's what makes you a good person right it's like we Definitely, can't yeah. always escape our problems mm-hmm. sometimes you have to be in a problem and just face it head on yeah yeah and from a scientific perspective they, they find now that um, emotion actually gets trapped in the fascia mm-hmm. so in in doing these postures you're actually relieving the the chemicals that are like stored mm-hmm. there so maybe that's why you cry I don't really know yeah totally <laughs> I joke around that I do Netflix yen all the time. So yeah. I'll do the posture, but I don't want to. I don't want to feel it. Yeah. <laughs> just distract yourself just a little bit, <laughs> not to go too deep. Yeah. We had a friend who was uh, studying uh, yoga in the same way. We do it around, you know, the television with family, and he, he got injured. Like there was, you know, it's like, why am I getting injured if I'm doing my yoga? And it's like, well, what, what's your quality of yoga? Why, well, you know, I do my stretching. I'll put on. TV and it's like yes but you're never getting the stillness so now it's like been distilled as like movement is medicine for your body stillness is medicine for your mm-hmm. mind your mind is your body your body is your mind mm-hmm. you need as much of the stretch as you need the silence because mm-hmm. the silence gives you that time to like integrate so it's like you know when your heart is opening if you're distracted it, nothing's going to happen mm-hmm. <laughs> there's nowhere the energy is going to go because it has to flow and in order yeah. to flow there has to be space and if there's no silence there's no space, of course, not physical space, but, you know. And it's interesting when you stay, because so yeah. you get into something like pigeon. The second that you're in pigeon, your body goes, how do I get out? Yeah. I'm freaking out. I don't yeah. like this. And you, all this stuff just starts happening, and you just wait, and then it goes away. Even though the sensations are actually increasing, yes. your brain just shuts off. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm hoping more and more from like when we address suffering. So when we when we look at others, a lot of people, you know, see it in the sense of, uh, you know, hurt people. Uh, so hurt people hurt people. But, you know, there's also another way of seeing it as like broken people help broken people. Mm-hmm. It's because there's a sort of like understanding like a snake knows a snake and a saint knows a saint. And it's like I can understand you because I can relate to you. I have sympathy or I have empathy. And these energies sort of collide and uh, sort of coalesce. What I find most interesting is when it's the opposite, when it's... It's because there's extra to share and it gets shared. So for example, like in the in the posture, you have only so much capacity. When you realize how much is actually within you that you can hold for 15 minutes and you have that validation. It's not a gold star, mm-hmm. it's not a participation ribbon, it's just simply the witness position between at the beginning it's you and your teacher yeah. uh, obviously the teacher's seeing it happen so there's still that feeling but eventually it's just you and you get that um, mm-hmm. endorphin release and that you know achievement mm-hmm. uh, in yourself and intrinsically because you feel it that you have accomplished something and I think when it comes down to sharing with others whether we're sharing it we first have to share it in ourselves once we have it it naturally comes out as a natural motivator. The exemplarship sort of says like, well, if I can do it, you know, and I couldn't do it, Mm -hmm. then you can do it, even though you think you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, then actually don't do it. You know what I mean? Like make that decision and just know that you're making that decision or try to do it and get as far as you can. And then let's take it as a practice to progress. So I find it like really interesting when working with like others why certain people can and have a natural proclivity to it, I think it's because they've done it for themselves first. Mm -hmm. And then they have this sort of ability to take that practice of what they've done for themselves. And, you know, it's no longer broken. It's actually more precious or the person is more precious because they've healed their cracks. They've worked through their own brokenness. And so they allow that energy to flow to another and it isn't about being perfect it's about yeah. practicing and ryan had a hilarious cue in that class where we were meant to hold he's like all right and type a people i want you to come out <laughs> and everyone that like re- refuses to hold he's like you stay you stay yeah. today like, yeah. and only you guys know who who you are yeah. there um i think like with uh with that we have this illusion of like control you know like mm-hmm. we can shape life 
but in a yin posture, it's like no life's happening to you. No matter how grand we think we are, um, life ultimately will go on its own accord. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot like the yin posture. It's like the pain's coming. You're yeah. only a witness to the pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, and it's just, it's this constant art of learning to be compassionate with yourself mm -hmm. and with understanding. And going back to that article where people were backlashing this, what I thought was really positive. My my only reply on there was it's it doesn't matter. Like all, all this negativity, it doesn't matter. Our jobs as human beings mm -hmm. is to care for one another. That's right. Mm -hmm. We don't need to know the reason why someone is hurting or why it hasn't gotten better yet. Whether you have to help someone once or a thousand times, that's mm -hmm. your job as a human being. This other stuff just isn't helpful. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. But that's the danger of social media, right? Like, as soon as you put something out there, like, anybody can... Oh, God, yeah. I took that right down. I was like, I don't yeah. even want this stuff on my wall. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. <laughs> what, what was the major lesson of the art? Like, what, what really pissed people off I'm wondering? It was a lot of people just like, well, why don't they just get over it? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah, that's a... That's They're like, other groups of people have dismissal. suffered. Yeah, it's... <laughs> And it was a lot of people, well, A, that have not suffered. They yes. have not suffered, suffered like this. Little. Like, if my Privilege. grandma, who yeah. lived in the Brazilian rainforest, taking care of seven sibli seven younger siblings because her parents died, if grandma wants to have an opinion, let grandma talk, okay? Whether yeah, yeah. it's right or wrong. But, like, mm -hmm. you guys grew up Privilege. middle class, exactly. white Canadians. You, you don't get to say something so harsh. Like, it's ridiculous. It's sort of like that Black Lives Matter movement where, like, everyone's everyone's trying to push for everyone's um, benefit, but it's like, it doesn't even, like, deal with me, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, like from their perspective, it's like, um, it's like you're, why do we care so much about this one? There's so much other suffering going on in the world as well, you know? We're yeah. just highlighting the one um, that you think Mm -hmm. is the most beneficial you know what I'm saying yeah like, totally I mean like we should we should be helping people no matter what yeah, race exactly. or background yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah 100% yeah and that's why I just didn't understand why people even need to make it a case like this is a non-issue mm -hmm. this is just a non-issue yeah, sure. like I'm just exactly. like I'm just here to help some people exactly what, what happened is erroneous really at this point mm -hmm. someone asked me they were like why don't you do it was actually my father one day he said why don't you do what you're doing in Peru here and I said, well, it's a totally different circumstance here. Like, there's so much privilege here. There's some resources. Even, yeah, well, yeah, we have yeah. resources. But even just, like, he was asking me in, like, the proverbial sense. And I was like, uh, there's there's still a huge uh, discrepancy. You'd have to go to see it. But yeah. it's, um, it's, a di it's a different thing. Also, though... Uh, there's privilege there too and uh, the privilege there is that there's a Carmen and there's a center and there's an orphanage and because when I was in India there was even less you know so it's like there are levels and uh, the world is on fire and you have a small water pail uh, what you can do with that you know is up to you you can wear it as a hat like some of these people do and then just pull it over their head and yeah. like an uh, ostrich you know when the danger's coming it's like what danger just stick my head in the sand and you know life goes on you know i'm self-interested i think that's the great sin is self-interest uh that's what uncle jeff always said to me um if we really follow down like where all evil comes from like the you know the path to hell is paved with good intention it's like it's just people get scared they enter into fear states totally. and this leads to all sorts of perspectives gone you know pervertedly wrong yeah. very very perverted wills start to occur alcohol is a you know one of those things that a lot of you know cultures like the North American culture before Europe came to North America uh, same with India same with the East alcohol was not a you know a staple mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with cultures that it's a very new to their blood and to their genetics and it creates a really 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 uh dark uh, energy because it becomes very selfish yeah. and of course it's not it's not the it's not the, the it's not the substance but it's the suffering uh, that gets amplified by the substance totally. so the drug abuse um, the alcoholism uh, even if it wasn't drugs and alcohol these people would just be lost displaced people mm. 
just without anything, without any amplification, stimulant yeah. or inhibitor. So when I look at things of like people getting actively involved because, you know, I suffered and, you know, I can self-identify with another suffering. And, you know, what I said to my dad was one day I will. You know, when I find the right thing, you know, because, you know, we all help out in our local community because mm -hmm. no matter how privileged we are, there's always suffering. You yeah. can suffer. Again, what Uncle Jeff said to me is like, you can suffer on a thimble of water or you can, you know, you can drown on a thimble or you can drown on the ocean. Like, again, yeah. if you're drowning, you're drowning. So for some people, it's a thimble. It's sad, but they're suffering. Mm -hmm. Just like a 16-year-old girl suffers, you know, before the mm -hmm. prom with a pimple. Yeah. It, for her, it's the end of the world, you know? And then you learn as you get older, it's not the end of the world. But then everything as you get older keeps feeling like it's the end of the world until you start to meet Aboriginal youth with a 50% suicide rate. And that's yeah. daunting. That is like, my mind, I remember seeing the first article I ever read on it, and I couldn't, I still have it, I still have it. That's why it's like no coincidence meeting you and... Uh, I really feel it's true serendipity because I couldn't believe I had read one of the suicide letters and it was just like words. It was like the 16 year old kid. It was in cramps. It was so heart wrenching. And it was just like uh, lost, um, uncared for. And it was just like all of these things that we take so much for granted mm -hmm. and people with privilege can just like dismiss. Yeah. And it's so essential that human element, that human connection, getting involved is such a natural thing. Yeah. Uh, for those, yeah, I'll let you guys, yeah, we're talking, so. The, the interesting part I can talk is that it, it's all, uh, it's actually all self-interest states. Yeah. You know, even, even in doing um, altruistic things like you're saying, it comes back to your self-interest of you were like, oh, it makes me feel better, right? But what I think the differentiator is the compassion. So you mm -hmm. you exercise compassion, you know, yeah. versus like, because in the end, it always comes down to me as a person. Yeah. Even being here, it's like, well, I wanted to be here, so it's self-interested, you know? Well, and like the small bucket thing, like I didn't pick this as something like cool or trendy, like, mm -hmm. hmm, what group of people? Exactly. Help? This is exactly. it. The stories about the the teen suicides that gets to me. Yeah. That is in the community that I live in. That's exactly. where the need is. Like I'm not going externally because there's there's things right where I live that exactly. need help. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it was like with Peru. It was like it was brought to us. You know, it was totally. it was a project. It was happening. It was with a, a high school teacher of mine back in the day. Uh, it came about very naturally, organically. The connection was there. Mm. Uh, Carmen had the natural proclivity and interest to study yoga. And it was all just sort of, you know, it all happened on its own accord, its own measure. Yeah. I've always felt it's just a template. It's always just, it was just a call. That's your dharma. That it's exactly, like, exactly. This is, this is my dharma. This has come that's to right. me and I'm just saying yes. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's the differentiation when you have volition. It's like, yeah, you can be altruistic. And that implies a level of volition. Like, oh, uh, I'm good. So now I want to help out with, you know, what things are around me. And that's fantastic. Then there's another sort of dharma, which is you're working through your own thing. And by working through that, it inspires another to say, hey, would you like to share this thing that you're currently doing for yourself with another mm -hmm. who could also greatly benefit from this? Totally. And you make that decision not out of self-interest, but out of sacrifice of self-interest because yeah. you're on your own path. Like you got your own work to do. Like we all have our own stuff to do yeah. and we could look at our little small worlds and just sort of get lost in it. But it's neat to sort of take the blinders off and see through a self-identified state another suffering as your own and realize, wow, something magically came into my life, uh, whether I worked for it or not, yeah. there is always chance and there is always um, uh, the probability of the unknown sort of entering into our lives, the divine grace, we call it many things. But and there's I, a paying it forward too, yeah, once you kind of yeah. got over your own, your own stuff. And you don't need to be messed up to work with kids, but I de definitely think it helps that you can share... <laughs> You can share your own struggles yeah. with teenagers to not, for me not to go into the room and be like, I have everything, like, right. everything's figured out, That's I'm right. perfect. They don't want to hear that. They can't relate to that. So uh, it's very much just about being honest that, it, That's right. you know, I am just figuring things out. Everybody's just figuring it out and we're doing the best that we can. I think one of the things that I've noticed too is like uh, people 
so even like with the kids it's like they're kids so when I meet them they're just souls but you know we, we talk about them we're labeling them as orphan children or you know at risk girls or mm-hmm. you know aboriginal or indigenous or first nations you know there's all these labels and I think the beauty of the yoga is that and meditation specifically is you well the same yoga for the body uh, meditation for the mind is you strip away those labels it's like whether you're working with kids in Peru whether you speak the language or not there's a language of the heart and it's the same thing with you know indigenous it's, it'll be the same thing with African it'll be the same thing with Japanese it, kids are kids people yeah. are people souls are souls and uh, when you strip away the labels when you you know have a practice that sort of uh, uh, disenchants and de-identifies the very nature of the problem which is I am relating to this trauma I am relating to this suffering mm-hmm. I am relating to this group of marginalized people and we're able to now identify with uh, you know a, maybe a more universal or a more essential mm-hmm. property that we all share the human condition yeah, we really try and get the girls to share their experiences with each other as well because when when you're young or, or even when you're old we very much think that our experience is our own and that no one else can possibly understand or has experienced this and then you get everyone talking and it's just it's the same story again and again and and there's comfort in that and that it's that they're not unique in their experience sometimes um, getting them to connect to like we'll do like back to back meditations where they can just feel each other's breath um, just branching out and connecting to others that way is so important I think because um, you both spoke about like um, observing the kid uh, I, I love working with kids mm-hmm. because um, not because I'm seeing something I can shape but they're reminding me of a purity that was once there you know yeah. like as you get older it starts to we start to harden who we think we are and who we think the world is mm-hmm. you know but they're they're still open like yeah. we, we worked with the kids in Peru and I, I they like love me not because of um, my being like I, you are an orphan but it's like you will remind me of your innocence I will just treat yeah. you like you're innocent you know it's that resiliency yeah totally and, yeah. and it's the danger I find of like looking at them like they're hurt that's what's gonna make them feel like they're hurt you yeah. know it's like when you when they stub their toe if you go like oh no no like are you okay then yeah. they're gonna be like oh I'm gonna cry because it, <laughs> it's meant to do this right yeah. but if you're like get up and we're gonna keep going you yeah. know builds a stronger foundation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find kids are like the real light in me that sees the light in you you know yeah totally that, that's actually one of my most challenging hurdles is there's such a difference in kids with just like a couple of years like an 11 year old is nothing like a 13 year old like a 15 year old like I said like they're so different mm-hmm. you can go from being very much like childlike and innocent mm-hmm. to real adult problems yeah, really sure. young well they're, they're all like um, because like they're being shaped and surrounded by so many people uh, who are judging them yeah. you know it's, mm-hmm. that, that becomes an adult like a judgment is an adult problem mm-hmm. but if you put two kids together that are like two ethnicities they're just going to play because there's yeah. no identifications you know I have a really rad group of uh, girls there's just three of them and I don't think they're they hang out with too many other kids in school and just like three and they're tight and they're like no we do our own thing um like we're weird <laughs> this is like our group yeah, for sure. and I was like you know what? that's all you need you guys have each other like they're so immune to any of that other crap that's sure. happening in school like they're yeah. so lucky to have yeah. um a tight group like that you ever hear about Morai in Japan there it's like a, your it's like a set of five people that you grew up with Okay. You become your weird group, and then okay. like, throughout life, you you like bounce ideas, and you feel like you're not alone because you have these five. Yeah. Sounds like the girls, you know. Totally, like, especially in like a social media world yeah, where we're sure. like just trying to accumulate friends, and like all these friendships mean nothing. No, They're just, not at all. And you think that you know people because of all the things that you see, but it's mm-hmm. it's those close relationships with your weird friends that mm-hmm. really matter. Exactly. Do you find that working with youth that that's become a problem, social media? Oh, it's so huge. Like, when I was bullied, I didn't, I'm dating myself, but I didn't have social media. When I went home, I was safe. So that's a huge difference now. Like, Mm. 
there there are girls calling each other out on Facebook Live, mm-hmm. like yeah. yelling out rumors at each other. Um, it's it's really vicious now. It's and they all have cell phones, like in schools. It's crazy. Um, we would have got like the ruler for that, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, everything's different. Schools are different. Kids are different. Kids are growing up way faster, and and they're always looking. I don't know. They're they're always influenced by social media. Do you do you uh, have a way to deal with this or? Like, do you just by having conversations about it, by oh. like actually addressing it, um, my teachers that originally uh, taught me some of the youth stuff, they do really great things with girls and boys in classroom scenarios. So like my one teacher, Ali, talks with the girls, Jiang works with the boys, and then they sometimes get together and they have these very interesting conversations with both genders back and forth about like oh. what they think the other one thinks about this and then they have honest conversations about like what do they actually think about this and it's really transforming work because usually the things that people would actually do themselves is very different than what they think is expected of them when at the core of everyone like I, I believe that humans are innately good but they make very poor decisions based on what they think is expected of them or what they think is going to be done to them if everyone was just truthful, we'd have a way different set of actions. Mm, definitely, yeah. It's uh, it's uh, it's the isolation amidst mm. like, like you know, you can you can live in an apartment building and not know to anyone, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. And but like we're surrounded by people all the time. Like our culture is very um, warped in that way. Yeah. You know, we're we're not going back to the First Nations people where where it's like they live in small groups and they know each other and like communication is key. Mm-hmm. Whereas like now it's like it's like uh, I don't know how to say it, but like very much isolated amidst non isolation. Totally. Yeah. 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 One of those honest conversations that Gian does with the boys is he um, he has them write down the top three things that they think is important in a relationship. So uh-huh. they all go and they write that down. And then he gets out his big whiteboard and he's like, all right, what do you guys think is the top three things? What do you think everybody else says? And everyone is like, sex is like number one. And I can't remember what the other two were. And he's like, all right, everyone look at um, the papers. And like not one person no has way. even wow. listed sex. It's like love, compassion, good communication, uh-huh. a best friend, like these beautiful things. Meanwhile, they think everyone else thinks like these really shallow concerns. Yeah. So those are really cool conversations. Yeah, it's like a collective shaping of mindsets, but like, Mm -hmm. again, that isolation thing, because we think, you know, the society's looking at it one way, but we don't realize we're all looking at it the same way. Yeah, he does really good work with the boys. It's all about like what what it really means to be a man and like what what he thinks, what society expects you to act like. Mm -hmm. And here's what it means to be like a real good human being. Do they have uh, initiation? rituals or like rites or something like that mm-hmm. you know like um to become a man before you had to pass through an initiation yeah but now we don't have that society so we're just like we're a lot of like adult kids oh yeah you know yeah you is don't there, have to pass the test anymore. exactly right yeah, yeah, yeah is there is there anything that you've seen that um they do uh or maybe you like, you guys like do? Gian or like first nations um and anybody um, like because you you know. deal primarily with yeah like, you yeah. Do you, do you, because like even that um, that that whiteboard thing. Um, yeah. That's like a an eye opener. That's sort of like an initiation of like mm-hmm. um, seeing that things are an illusion. Mm-hmm. You know what you really think is not what's really being go like what's really going on. Yeah. So is there anything like? Um, do you see anything like that? Do you no. Implement anything like that? No. Do First Nations people do anything like that still? Or? Not that I know of, but again, I'm still learning. Oh, yeah. I'm still learning. I think what it is is it's like it's it's more of like what we talked about when we were in Peru. It's like there's ritual and there's awakened ritual. Mm-hmm. I think what you're searching for by alluding to the whiteboard is like the awakened ritual, mm-hmm. like waking up. Yeah. And it's all about waking yeah. up. It's all about accepting responsibility. Mm-hmm. But when you have a whole community of adults that are wallowing, right, literally like and lamenting and just suffering and just you know decay you know it's just like if the adult 
again, it's a top-down problem. If the adult, if the adults are dissolving and decaying, then what's happening to the youth? Who's shaping yeah. the youth? Who are the exemplars? Why do we have someone from outside of Kenora playing such an active role in the actual, you know, cultural like landscape mm-hmm. of you know indigenous peoples? These conversations are important to have with kids because kids do not, for the most part, talk to their parents. Mm-hmm. Even like the nicest families, the best parents, often teenagers do not talk about what they're going through. They may not even talk about that with their peers. So it's very important that we are creating people as youth leaders that aren't exactly. the parents because kids might talk to me and tell me things that they're never going to tell mom and dad mm-hmm. and they, they need to tell someone that's not 14. I think what's interesting about that is is that in our, so for example, kids in this area, and I'm, sh- I'm sure there's ex- exceptions and there's probably a very small percent, will take that to the extreme and commit suicide. Mm-hmm. But in your area, it's 50%, like the, mm-hmm. the, the statistics are pretty consistent now since like the early 2000s that this rising energy of teen suicides has been on the rise. Mm-hmm. And it's like set a precedence where it's like, you know, why would we have an aha moment about the illusion? The illusion is just so great. The circumstances are just so daunting that it's actually a better cho- like choice or solution to take my own innocent child life because it's so bad. And that's a suffering that I don't think we quite understand here living, you know, in, you know, in, in urban centers and suburbs, although it's, you know, kids have their obstacles. I don't think it's anything close to the reality of um, what is happening with a people. And I think that's the key issue. It's a people, uh, a people. And because there's such a lack of understanding, I think this, you know, this conversation is, like you said, always learning. I think, you know, that's what this is all about. This conversation is about that, taking another step forward to understand uh, and then share it in our circles in order to understand that we don't understand and to listen and to, uh, you know, have a good arbiter, you know, someone on the front lines who's actually getting the direct experience themselves. Because it's right. very different to look at a problem from the outside yeah. or look at it from, you know, a governmental position or an NGO and another way where you're just sort of, you know, and, you know, a really, truly, you know, on the front lines as, you know, like a spiritual warrior in the sense where your resilience, like the word you keep using and determination is to, you know, place spirituality in the way of suffering. Because I think that's where spirituality comes from. It's like, what is going to lift you above your body when you're being raped? What is going to lift you above your mind when you're suffering from crippling anxiety and, you know, let's say, you know, absolutely paralyzing depression? The Mm -hmm. only thing that's going to do that is something spiritual, which is this like quality that is, you know, not able to be given, but is like inherent within each of us. Well, this is just an urgent issue because this this is whole communities of people that are suffering. So even if that one person has, say, a spiritual awakening, even the strongest person, when they're surrounded by suffering and people that they really love and care about are hurting, they can still go down that really sad path. So this is this is a call for way more people to care. Exactly. Everybody needs to care, and we need to help lots of people right now. I think that's why we're honored to have you here and have you part of our community to sort of, you know, shed light on the issues that are happening within our own backyard. And, mm-hmm. you know, they kept celebrating this year the 150, you know, anniversary of Canada. And it was, you know, mm-hmm. it was wonderful to hear from, you know, our uh, prime minister at the UN there when he said, you know, but it's much older than that. You know, the country itself was a country long yeah. before that for millennia. Yeah. And if you think about that, it's like, wow, there really was a history here. Yeah. There really was a story about this particular rock. You yeah. know, this rock was important. And this rock symbolized uh, a whole storytelling uh, narrative that comes from an oral tradition that is mm-hmm. not, you know, uh, a Eurocentric understanding. And um, again, there's a there was a genocide in North America that's clear, uh, but uh, it started in Europe. The Europeans, you know, cleaned house, 
to their own indigenous peoples, you know? So it's sort of like, um, it's a human, it's a human condition. Uh, and like you said earlier, it's a it's it's a human problem that we all need to get behind. Yeah. It's something that we all need to be awake to. And I think the first thing ultimately is ignorance, because that's how we mm-hmm. sort of started. It was just the pale thing, people putting their yeah. you know head in the sand like the ostrich, you know. And I think it's ignorance yeah. first. So ignorance is always battled by education. Yeah. Education will always be the threat to ignorance. Um, science has been great getting hard concrete science around things because they're always sad stories but you know when you collect these sad stories and you start making numbers and you start actually you know counting deaths like these things are really really paramount and we're at like a place right now where you know we can really do a lot more if we you know stop being so ignorant and you know allowed ourselves to be aware of the issue Fortunately for you, you live in the area. Unfortunately for us, it's uh, you know a full day's drive within our own province. You know what I mean. So uh, I think for us, I think you know having you here and you know you know shedding light on the issue uh, as an exemplar and as you know as an inspiration to young women, I think it's very important as exemplars to you know do what we can in the capacity mm-hmm. that we can and not an inch more or less because then it's not authentic and it becomes like beach said earlier altruistic or you know it becomes more self-interested again and at the end of the day we're not helping people to help ourselves we're helping people because people need a hand up not a push down yeah the biggest thing that people need to understand if they take anything from this anyone that's comparing uh what our European ancestors went through to what First Nations people are suffering through is that uh, like our, our grandparents, the, the systems that were bringing them down were destroyed and they had a chance to start fresh. That's right. Whereas the systems that we initially created to put this group of people down are still in place. That's They're right. not better. Even though residential schools are a thing of the past, the trauma of the residential school. But the the reserves themselves, the, the reserves treaties, themselves, the, right. there's, there's so many things in place still that prevent people from doing better for well, themselves. Well, they're not self-determined, like, and that's what the Prime Minister said, you know, we mm-hmm. need to move towards self-determination. Mm-hmm. You know, people's rights need, to, like, the actual, you know, Aboriginal right, Indigenous right needs to be honoured. We're not even honoured. There's uh, I was hearing a story about, you know, they actually rerouted the water supply so that Winnipeg could get the water. And this whole community that was living north of Kenora just suffered because the yeah. water was no longer going to their inhabitants. It was being rerouted. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oops. It's like, yeah, but oops means, you know, people, yeah. you know, it's like you were entitled to do what? You know, yeah. where is the check and balance? Yeah. You know, how do we coexist? And I think that's just the main thing. Anyone that f- is fighting against carrying compassion is Beautiful. wrong. You're wrong. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thanks for coming. You know, thanks I think that was, a, I think that's it. You know, <laughs> like anyone, you know, carrying compassion is definitely the key. And I think this is an indigenous issue. And I think, you know, as Canadians, we need to be more caring and compassionate in all aspects of our life. Mm-hmm. And yoga is just a practice that, you know, helps us to find that. And uh, there are many others and they all take formal and informal ways. But being a good person always begins with the heart. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a language we can all understand. So thank you so much for being here, Carla. We're really excited to train you. Yay. Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> like, do you have any, like... Oh. Are you interested to ask us? Because you have our attention now. Like, you're yeah. going to spend time with us. I don't but. know. I don't know what to expect. I'm just, I'm open. I'm excited for whatever. Awesome. We'll see. Okay. Well, amazing. Thank you, you so much. Training. I like it. <laughs> that was a great conversation. <laughs>